No matter how life began, on the backs of crystals or in the test tube of some intelligent designer, everyone agrees it started with a single cell. But what is a cell? Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Darwin wrote uh, The Origin of Species in 1859, published it in 1859. He had an idea of the cell as being quite simple, correct? Yeah, everybody did. Yeah, okay. If, if he thought of the cell as being a Buick, what is the cell now in terms of its complexity by comparison? A galaxy. If Darwin thought a cell was, say, a mud hut, what do we now know that a cell is? More complicated than uh, a Saturn V. So what is in a cell as far as we know now? A world that Darwin never could have imagined. I needed someone who could give me a glimpse into this world. So we went to molecular biologist Doug Axe. Think of a cell as being a nano factory, a factory where on a very small scale, digital instructions are being used to make the components of the factory. Here we have the famous DNA double helix. You can see the helical strands that are intertwined and wind around each other on the outside of the molecule. This is the material that stores all of our genetic information. In higher life forms, this will be the equivalent of something like a gigabyte of information stored in the molecules that form the individual chromosomes, all packed within the nucleus, which is a tiny fraction of the entire cell size. So what does DNA do? Well, the information in DNA ends up providing the information for sequencing the amino acids to make protein. We have information in a one-dimensional form that provides the information for a three-dimensional form. I'm finally just beginning to grasp the complexity of the cell. Are there systems within the cell that go well beyond Darwinian evolution? Some type of cellular technology that drives adaptation, replication, quality control, and repair? What if these new mechanisms have massive design implications? Well, I say, so be it. The cell really is like nothing we've ever seen in the physical world. That's got to be firmly grasped. That's, that's, that's not something we can just say, oh, well, it's just a little bit more of the same old, same old. It's not the same old, same old. We are finding is that there's information that's in the cell that cannot be accounted for in terms of these undirected material causes. So there's, it has to and, be. And so there's, there's some, some other, so there has to be an information source. So one of the key questions faced by modern biology is, where do you get information from? Well, uh, Darwin assumed that the increase in information comes from natural selection. But natural selection reduces genetic information. And we know this from all the genetic population studies that we have. And where is the new genetic information going to come from? Well, that's the big question. So when we find information in the DNA molecule, the most likely explanation is that it too had an intelligent source. I mean, we need engineering principles to understand these systems, okay? I mean, it's only because of our advancements in nanotechnology that we can even begin to appreciate these systems. But using intelligent design didn't seem to stop the scientists I spoke with, so why all the controversy? Suppose we find, simply as a matter of fact, that our scientific inquiries point in one direction. Which is that there is an intelligent creator. Why should we eliminate that from discussion? 
Streng verboten? How come? Why? Streng verboten. Very good. What does streng verboten mean? Strongly forbidden. Strongly forbidden. You've got two possible hypotheses. You've got a wall through the middle of your, through your brain, in effect, through your thinking. You say, well, you can't consider anything on this side of the wall. Only hypotheses on this side of the wall are permissible for consideration. What about academic freedom? I mean, can't we just talk about this? They, their reply is that science is not a democratic process. Oh, really? And that there is a consensus view. But wait and a minute, but, we are to subscribe to but the wait a second, view. but Darwin challenged the consensus view, and that's how we got Darwinism. If Darwin wanted to challenge the consensus today, how would he do it? Science isn't a hobby for rich aristocrats anymore. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. And if you want a piece of the pie, you've got to be a good comrade. Scientific ideas. How we get them to you, the people. Every idea must be inspected to ensure that it is safe. All theories must pass through a series of checkpoints. First, the academy. Getting a controversial theory through the academy can be dangerous. Few people know this better than Congressman Mark Souter. He uncovered a targeted campaign led by individuals within the Smithsonian and the National Center for Science Education to destroy Dr. Sternberg's credibility. If you want peer reviews, if, if you want to be published, if you want to go to respected institutions, the, the core view does not tolerate dissent. There's kind of a, this is the way it is, and anybody who's a dissenter should be squashed. Are you going to be on my side if I let you up? Sure, take sure. I'm on your side. Just let me up. I'll do anything you say. Souter isn't the only one who has witnessed the Academy's tactics. Journalist Larry Witham has seen similar behavior during his 25 years of covering the evolution controversy. Once you're, you're thick in science, you can't question the paradigm. But if you want to get grants, if you want to be elected to high positions, if you want to be get awards as a promoter of public education of science, you can't question the paradigm. People cannot be trusted to form their own opinions. This business about open-mindedness is nonsense. Why is the scientific establishment so afraid of free speech? There is this fear that if one aspect of a theory is closely scrutinized, there's going to be an unraveling. Who are you? Oh, I, I, I am the great and powerful Wizard of Oz. I interviewed dozens and dozens of scientists, and uh, when they're amongst each other or talking to a journalist who they trust, uh, they'll speak about, um, you know, it's, it's incredibly complex or molecular biology is in a crisis, but publicly they can't say that. Keeping a keen eye on the Academy are various watchdog organizations. Listen to Eugenie Scott of the National Center for Science Education. The NCSE has been at the heart of virtually every evolution controversy over the past 25 years vigorously defending the Darwinian gospel. We have had a lot of business, unfortunately, at NCSC in the last few years because virtually every state in which science education standards has come up for consideration has had a big fight about the coverage of evolution in them. NCSC was started by a group of scientists and teachers who were very concerned because in the late 70s and early 80s there were a lot of attempts to pass equal time for creation science and evolution laws and clearly this is something that neither scientists nor teachers liked. It wasn't exactly help help the creationists are coming but it's you know kind of along those lines. Most scientists uh, just throw up their hands and say creationists they drive me crazy you know you handle it. We've worked a lot with science education organizations. The most important group we work with is members of the faith community because the best kept secret in this controversy is that Catholics and mainstream Protestants are okay on evolution. Are you sure about that, Eugenie? Liberal Christians have been fighting with conservative Christians for so long that they'll side with anybody against the fundamentalists. And Eugenie Scott says, well, welcome over. There's a kind of science defense lobby, or an evolution defense lobby in particular. They are mostly atheists, but they are wanting to be, desperately wanting to be friendly to mainstream, uh, sensible religious people. 
And the way you do that is to tell them that there's no uh, incompatibility between science and religion. But is there really an incompatibility? Can't we believe in God and Darwin? Implicit in most evolutionary theory is that either there's no God or God can't have anything, any role in it. So naturally, as, as many evolutionists will say, it's, it's the strongest engine for atheism. If they called me as a witness, and a, and a lawyer said, uh, Dr. Dawkins, uh, has your belief in evolution, has your study of evolution turned you towards atheism? I would have to say yes. And that's the worst possible thing I could say for winning that, that court case. So people like me are bad news for the science lobby, the evolution lobby. By the way, I'm being a hell of a lot more frank and honest in, in this interview than many people in this field would be. Working hard to keep ideas in check are our friends in the media. Morning, paper. Paper the tendency is of the media is to side with the establishment because they inherently agree with the establishment. But Eugenie not... Scott, my understanding is that there is not a single peer-reviewed article out there that supports intelligent design. Am I wrong? You are not wrong. You are correct. I believe that we get coverage, but we always get coverage like we're the outsider, not like it's an even debate. But instead of merely reporting news, he analyzes it, often expressing his personal opinions. We constantly deal with reporters who refuse even to report the correct definition of intelligent design. They over and over again talk about uh, <clears throat> life is so complex god must have done it explain, just what, admit it it's why religion very why simple. you just can't it, it's religion it's a wanton distortion of our position study that i've got a hot story here you can look as, at associated press stories and the same sentence will appear in those stories for 10 years intelligent design says that life is too complex it's it's called a boilerplate and the reporter never reports anymore or gets any new ways to say it, so the, the public understanding never advances. But what happens if a reporter decides to take a more balanced approach to intelligent design? There might be uh, remarkable pressure on that reporter not to side against the evolutionists. I thought I told you to kill that story. Few reporters have learned this better than author and journalist Pamela Winnick. When she refused to take sides in an article she wrote about intelligent design, the Darwinists found a new favorite target. Number one, I wasn't Christian, I was Jewish. Number two, I wasn't religious. Number three, I was not taking a position uh, in favor of creationism. I was writing about intelligent design, and it didn't matter. After I wrote that one piece, everything I wrote on the subject was scrutinized. There were hate letters coming into the newspaper. If you give any credence to it whatsoever, which means just writing about it, you are just finished as a journalist. Other journalists we spoke with told similar stories, but didn't dare appear on camera. And now, the presses are ready to roll.